Thank you so much. I am overjoyed to be here. As I was getting a tour of the campus, I was hearing more about the college and so inspired um, by what you all stand for and are doing. So um, it's uh, great to share my ideas with you who are so, so uh, asking so many of the same questions I am. So I'd like to begin with the words of D. Hawk, who is the founder of Visa. It's ironic that he has my motto. He says, it is far too late and things are far too bad for pessimism. <laughs> and that's kind of the spirit I try to get up each morning in and uh, the spirit of my talk. And as you now know, I began, this is my 40th year since the birth of my first book and my first child in 1971. So this is a very big year for me, the 40th anniversary. And so I've been doing a lot of going back and thinking, who was I? What was I doing in that UC Berkeley Ag Library? And really, that was the beginning of a pathway of a whole series of why, why, why. And when I think about what I'm writing about now, what is an ecological worldview, I think it really has a lot to do with a continual a lifetime of asking why and making those connections. That's sort of what an ecological worldview means to me. But my first question seemed like a no-brainer. At 26, you know, I was being hit by all the headlines and, and experts telling us that, oh, we've run out of food in the world, and we hit the Earth's limits, and there wasn't enough food, and famine was right around the corner. Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, exploded right about that time. And so I sat in the library and thought, ah, food, if I could just understand, why is there hunger in the world? since that's what every species does. It feeds itself and it feeds its offspring, and we're not doing it. Then if I could understand why human beings were having such difficulty at this most primal task, that that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics. Food would become my teacher. That was my youthful hunch. And so pretty soon, with the help of a friendly librarian, which you needed in those days, I learned with my dad's slide rules help that, in fact, there was more than enough food to feed us all. Uh, just to say then and now, the present day, when I say more than enough food to feed us all, I mean that um, there's more than enough food to make us all chubby. And that's just counting the leftovers. What I mean by that is what's left over after we feed a third of the world's grain to animals that shrink it tremendously in its potential to feed us after we feed a third of the fish catch now to, um, to, uh, into animal production as well. That's new since I wrote Diet for a Small Planet. And now, today, 40% of our corn harvest is going to feed automobiles, going to feed vehicles. So that's what I mean by there's enough, even on the leftovers. Not that I'm condoning any of that waste. But the point is that we cannot blame nature hunger. And so then I said, okay, why? Why are we actually turning, how have we created this, this disposal system and called it productive? How, why? Why? Why am I part of a system that every day is taking this incredible abundance of the earth and actively shrinking its capacity to feed people? And that question has become more and more and more central in my life in some ways, because today, despite that vast increase, and I would say the pretty steady per person increase in food production, on up to now, but there are more hungry people in the world than ever before. Almost a billion people are going hungry. So why, why, why? Is it that simply we don't know how to organize ourselves to end the poverty that actually is at the root of hunger, and that we don't really know how to make access to healthy food available, um, possible. And obviously, we do know how. I mean, even our own country. There was a decade from the late 50s to the early 70s, basically the, the 60s, in which we cut the poverty rate in half in this country. In which, therefore, people were more able to eat. Uh, we think of a country like Brazil, very poor, very hungry. And yet, recently, they have cut poverty depending on what tool you're measuring with, by about 40% in about 15 years. That's pretty dramatic. 
So, and then I'm going to tell you other stories which put a lie to the notion that we just don't know how to organize ourselves to enable people to eat. So then I ask, okay, is it human nature? Are we just that callous? Is our species just that unfeeling and that selfish and competitive and materialistic that we just can't overcome these basic traits of human nature? So I spent a lot of time thinking about what do we know about human nature? And actually, uh, scientists will call it, as I've seen several call what we're going through right now, a revolution in understanding ourselves. It's coming because of breakthroughs in neuroscience, now that we can use the MRI scans to see what parts of our brains are stimulated with certain activities. There are new, new discoveries in, in anthropology as well, and, and now they're looking at toddlers, and I love this now that I have two granddaughters. They're looking at toddlers to understand human nature, which seems so, you know, smart, right? Before they get taken in by culture. <coughs> so we know a lot more, and what do we find? We find that actually human beings, most of us, come equipped with, with exactly the qualities that we need to tackle the environmental crisis, which is closely related to the hunger crisis, and you name it. We come, I like to say, we come equipped with these traits of, for example, cooperate. We love to cooperate. Think about what creates the school and their wonderful honor code that I was just hearing about. It's all based on cooperation. Well, the MRI people at Emory University looked at people who were competing and then uh, cooperating, and they found that when we cooperate, that parts of our brains are stimulated that are the same as when we eat chocolate. And that I love, because I really am a chocolate fanatic. So just think about it. Just as fun as chocolate, and a lot of more illicit activities as well, are right in there with the, the joy of cooperation. And then, of course, empathy. And I'll be talking about mirror neurons later in a moment. But empathy, um, the, the biological grounding of empathy was really a uh, real breakthrough happened in Italy in the 1990s when they discovered what they call mirror neurons. How many of you have ever heard of mirror neurons? I, I just love this. It means that as I'm doing this, there are actually neurons in your brains that are doing this. You, whatever, think of this as power. Whatever you perceive, your brain is actually incorporating it to some degree as if you were actually doing it. And when people are looking at you, same. So it tells us a lot about the power that we have, too. I'll return to that. But, but it, it is also the basis of empathy. That's why when we see somebody touch a flame, we jump, because we're wired that way. And so I like to think that we're at least as empathetic as the rhesus monkey. And the rhesus monkey, if these really cruel researchers did this, but it's very informative, that they will go for days, if put in a situation where they have to push a lever that gives a shock to another rhesus, they will go for days. One monkey went for 12 days without eating in order to avoid hurting his buddy. So we have a lot of equipment <laughs> that allows us to empathize with one another. So cooperation, empathy, also fairness. I'm convinced that, and there's new studies on this too, uh, but that because we evolved in these tightly knit groups, tribes, and we knew that cohesion, that the preservation of us as individuals depended on preservation of the tribe, and what breaks down a tribe faster than you know people getting mad at each other because things are unfair. So we came really came a long way. And I think there's a lot of evidence for this too, that, that we appreciate fairness and we react very badly. Um, and it even makes us unhealthy when we sense things are not fair. Um, and again, the monkeys again, it's not just us. Capuchin monkeys will throw back their rations to their caretakers if they're feeling that they're getting a raw deal. If, if somebody gets a raisin and they get a Mush, oh, excuse me, a cucumber, and it's not quite as tasty, they will throw it back to the protest. <laughs> so, fairness, a deep need for fairness. Even Adam Smith, the godfather of greed, supposedly, he wrote, quote, while some moral sentiments are optional, I believe he said, but he said, quote, we are in some peculiar manner tied, bound, and obliged to the observation of justice. So, cooperation, empathy, fairness, and I also feel strongly 
that there is evidence that we are not couch potatoes and whiners, that we could not have made it to these very complex societies unless we were also doers and need, with a deep need, as Eric Fromm, the social philosopher, put it so, so uh, er, in such erudite language, we need to make a dent. That's who we are. We need to feel that we have power. And if we can't express it positively, then it comes out negatively. But my point is that we, we come equipped with these traits. Most of us do. All of that. And we're also, if we look at history and the lab experiments, we also know how complex we are. Because while almost all of us have these qualities, these very pro-social qualities, we also know that most of us, not a few of us, most of us, under the wrong conditions, will be incredibly cruel, brutal to one another. Uh, whether we're talking about the lab experiment, say, that was done in the year Diet came out, 1971, in Stanford basement. How many of you have heard of the Stanford prison experiment? It's worth studying and reading Dr. Zimbardo's book, The Lucifer Principle. We have to take this in. What he did in the basement of his, in, in the building at Stanford, in this psych lab, he, he recruited <coughs> young people who tested normal in psychological tests to be in a mock prison, and he divided them into prisoners and guards, and it was supposed to last for two weeks, and he was going to observe the behaviors. He had to stop the experiment in six days because the guards were so brutal to the prisoners that there was emotional breakdown in six days. And later he testified in the Abu Ghraib prison uh, uh, trial because, to make this point, that if you put normal people in a terrible situation and concentrate power to that degree, and there are other factors I'm going to bring in in a minute, you, the result will be brutality among not a few, but most. And all we have to do, of course, is look at the Holocaust and recognize that it was not the result of a few madmen and sadists. Also, a very important book is called Ordinary Men, about 500 uh, regular guys in Hamburg, Germany, who were sent out in, into the Polish hamlets and told to kill point blank to kill Jews. And in the beginning, most of them resisted, said, no, I can't do this. In the end, 90% of these regular men, ordinary men, the book is called, participated in killing 38,000 Jews point blank and shipping tens of thousands more to death camps. So my point is we've got to get a grip, first of all, as we begin to recognize the damage, the losses, 100, excuse me, a billion people going hungry amidst greater plenty than ever before, as we are undermining our, our ecological home. We've got to get a grip on who we are, the good, bad, and ugly. And so then I ask, then I ask, okay, why aren't we bringing out these positive qualities of ourselves? We, we know that we have these amazingly positive pro-social qualities and learning how to keep the negatives in check by making sure those conditions don't show up. Why aren't we doing that? That seems like a no-brainer too. Well, with a lot of help from a lot of people, particularly the social philosopher Eric Fromm. Do you know his work? Um, you know, he really needs to be rediscovered. <laughs> he was popular in the 1970s, but his book, The Sane Society, should be on everybody's list. It really should be called The Insane Society, but he, um, he taught me a lot. But he wrote a book that I didn't read until the 1990s entitled The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, and something clicked for me. In that book, he says, it is man's humanity that makes him so inhumane. And he goes on to describe what is now more and more in the popular discourse, that human beings, the clue of why we're so, why we're living in such pain without being able to get ourselves out of this, is that we are, the clue is that human beings are creatures of the blind. We see the world according to what my daughter and I call a mental map and literally can't see what's off that map. You know, like the early cartographers, they made created maps and then they didn't know, they just put, they put monsters in the sea. Well, you know, we can't see outside of the, the way that we frame the world. And so that's all okay. But he says, when he says his man, human, in humanity that makes him so humane, it's in our mental map. It's the frame through which we're looking 
is fundamentally mal-aligned with our nature and the nature of nature, which is my thesis, the nature of our ecological home. If it is absolutely mal-aligned, meaning that it brings out the worst and keeps the best in check, then we're in big trouble. And so the power of this mental map came to me in a very homely way last Thanksgiving. When I got up on Thanksgiving morning and knew that I had to cook for 30 people coming in the afternoon. And I know one way to, oh, I, this is the second time I've done this. <laughs> Since I got here. Okay, I just poured another drink on the table. I will be remembered for my grace, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so I had to get up and cook. And I know a fast way to feed a lot of people is with root vegetables. And so I had this great dish I make in a, in a Dutch oven. And so I got out, and I started looking for this that I cook in all the time, and I could not find it. And I looked in the cupboards, I looked in the basement, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And I finally gave up on my root vegetable dish. Well, about an hour later, I turned around, and there it was. Except that I had put a plant in it. <laughs> now, my point in this humble analogy is that I had turned my um, Dutch oven that's red, by the way, it's not inconspicuous, and it's big, but I had turned it into a planter, so it didn't fit my mental map, so I could not see it. And I think that's our trouble today. Our mental map does not allow us to see all the solutions that are right around us. And so that is where I believe we are, that we have created this, um, this mental map that actually brings, that actually creates the very conditions that uh, bring out the worst in us. So what is the mental map? Very, very briefly, um, my thesis, and it's, this is all hypothesis. I want you to challenge me. But this is where I am in my 67th year. I am here. I am here. That I think the fundamental, if you peel away the layers, of what is the basis of the mental map that's doing us in, these core assumptions about reality, is lack, scarcity. And that's where I began. Maybe I just got stuck in the egg library at UC Berkeley. But that's what hit me. The assumption was lack. And then we end up creating the very lack we say we fear. And this has many personal and social and ecological dimensions of it. But let me just mention, lack of what? Lack of goods and lack of goodness is the way I summarize it. Lack of goods meaning lack of everything from food to energy to parking places in Boston. There's just not enough, you know, whatever it is. And there's not enough goodness in us. The assumption is when you peel away the extras and you go to what we can really count on, that's not just pretense, but what we can really count on in one another, it is that we are selfish, competitive, and materialistic. I kind of think we boil the caricature of humanity down to the selfish little shopper. You know, I see somebody dragging somebody out of Walmart on Black Friday. That's the kind of idea that is prevalent, and that's what advertisers go for, that we are selfish little shoppers. So if we take those two, scarcity of goods, and goods that mean uh, that's my little shorthand for all this stuff in the world, including energy and homes and jobs and places in great colleges like this, not enough of anything. And all we are is selfish and competitive, then where does that leave us? Pretty scared, pretty scared. And feeling like, oh my gosh, if we can just find any way out of this, and it leads then to our turning over our power. It only leads to powerlessness, I'm claiming, because it, we have this idea that we have to look at the expert, the official, and listen to somebody who's going to sort it out. Best of all, if we can just find an infallible law, an automatic force that will sort it out for us. And that's what I think is playing into this idea that Ronald Reagan named the magic of the market. That the idea that there is this infallible set of rules, or not rules, you know, just anything goes. And if we just let the market, this mystified notion, sort out outcomes, then it may not be ideal, but it's the best we can do. And if we flawed human beings, these selfish little shoppers, get involved in, in any way in that, we're going to make it worse. And so we hit upon the strange idea, not 
any kind of market because, you know, exchanging things has been around forever. But one peculiar notion of a market, which is one driven by one rule, highest return to existing wealth, people who run own, own corporations. And this is not anti any person. This is, I'm talking about the worldview. So, you know, I think sometimes, oh, didn't we all play Monopoly <laughs> as kids? And actually, Monopoly was created by a Quaker woman in the early 1900s. And she was trying to show us what would happen if we, if we let, it was called the landlord, I think was the name of her game. Uh, and if we just let, let it go, then at the, you know, at the end of the night, one person would have all the property, and wouldn't that be awful? And we'd wake up and realize that we need to create some values to keep the market open and fair. Instead, Parker Brothers got her game and kind of proved her point by turning into one of the few, you know, one of the many monopoly sectors in our society. Um, but my point is that um, it kills the market. The very thing that we love about the market is that it's free and open, and yet by this one rule, this this turning over our fate and kind of thinking, oh, it's too much for us to step up and put the market in any kind of values boundaries, I think, then it becomes, it kills itself in terms of being free and open, it becomes the monopolies that we see today. So, my, my point is then, from the premise of lack, we begin to create quite a number of conditions that I'm going to suggest today actually bring out the worst of us and generate the hunger and environmental destruction that we see today. Starting from the premise of lack and turning over our fate to others, and particularly to this um, mystified notion of a market that so concentrates wealth that we end up in what Citigroup, not Francis Marlopay, but Citigroup calls a plutonomy because 1% of us control as much wealth as the bottom 90% put together, is that we end up in creating the very conditions that have been proven, whether it's in the Stanford uh, prison experiment or in um, real life, like the Holocaust, what are the conditions that are certain almost to be at the worst in our species. And I'm just suggesting that we might start with extreme concentrations of power, brings out the worst in us, lack of transparency, secrecy. We think about the financial meltdown and we know that, you know, that, that one of the slogans of the people who were creating those derivatives and, and creating the, the slicing and dicing the risky mortgages and, and package, repackaging them, one of the slogans was IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. In other words, there was such a, an, an acknowledgement of non-transparency, of secrecy, that they realized that they could do what they would because they'd be out of there and with their money and we wouldn't know. So the second condition then is secrecy and the third is the blame game. The idea that, oh, there's, there's always, you know, it's always the other person, it's not me, it's always the other side. And that then is, is a cultural factor that I think brings out the very worst in us. So what, if you're at all with me to this point, I can begin then to, to say then that for me anyway, it gets very personal, extremely personal. Because if, if my quest, if my lifelong quest is to identify what are the conditions that, okay, I have this complex grasp, I think it's fairly complex of, of human nature, and then I'm beginning to ask, okay, what are the conditions that bring forth our, our joy and cooperation, our empathy, our, mm, our love to be problem solvers and all of that? Well, I would say then that it is the dissolving, the dissolution of these conditions that are not the worst, that we're flipping them, and we will begin to have the conditions that bring out the best. And so here, too, food and hunger, and now I'm, I'm finishing a new book uh, uh, about sort of how we think like an ecosystem, if you will. It's much more about the environment in general than just about hunger. But on any of these, then, it gives me a handle. Okay, what am I doing? What am I, what am I positing? What are, the, what are the actual, what does it look like? to be dissolving the conditions that bring out the worst in us and creating those that bring out the best. And I would say that the, the worst part of the three conditions that bring out the worst is that most of us feel powerless in that world of highly concentrated power, so much lack of transparency, and when we're just exposed daily to people blaming one another rather than stepping up with solutions. 
it tends to make us feel powerless when what the world needs more than ever is us all to feel powerful because we all need to be part of the solutions. And so what I'm working on and what I'm inviting you to critique and join me in is, is, is beginning to make real um, an idea of a, of a way of being together that is not just another ism, um, but is what I call living democracy. That is taking our democracy understood as a political system out there, finished and done sometime long ago, done to us or for us, and democracy is a living process in which our job is to make sure that we're creating the conditions to bring out the best in ourselves and others. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to get to make food, <clears throat> excuse me, food my teacher here. I managed to keep a few sips left. I just knocked this over twice. Um, so is to, okay, where are, with my food as my teacher, as my guide, I, I'm just so attracted to learning from where are people actually creating these conditions in order that people can eat. And I want to jump to India here for a moment to just be, uh, tell a bit of a story because if you're like me uh, and you listen to the news a lot, most Often you hear about India, you hear about the high-tech boom, and you hear that, oh, the number of Indian billionaires, according to Forbes last year, doubled. Um, and you hear about this great new middle class, and that's what you see in the movies, right? But if you look beneath that facade, what you don't see is living democracy emerging. Actually, India has many more hungry people than live in sub-Saharan Africa, which we do associate with hunger. About close, between 40 and 50 percent of Indian children are stunted by malnutrition. So that's one truth. And at the village level, there is something really powerful emerging from which all of us, I believe, can learn. For example, um, yes, we hear about the high-tech jobs. What we don't hear is that in there are now about 100,000 village cooperatives creating dairy products, mainly milk, organized by Indian village women, a network of cooperatives that is producing about a fifth of the milk in India today. And it, conservatively, I compared the number of jobs being created by these village co-ops and the number of high-tech jobs, and it's at least four or five times more. That's a very conservative estimate created right there in villages, uh, empowering, again, dispersing, dispersion of power, accepting, you know, instead of the blame game, a mutual accountability for solutions, which is what a cooperative requires, and a lot of initiatives, and things have to be transparent also in a cooperative. So the conditions are flipped. Um, and um, so worldwide, it turns out, again, the mental map, we don't see this because we're, we're just sort of looking for the Dutch oven instead of the planter, what we don't see is that uh, the number, number of cooperatives in the world has doubled in the last 30 years, and there are likely more people who are members of cooperatives worldwide than there are people who own shares in publicly traded companies. And actually one of the most uh, prosperous areas of, of Europe is in the northern area of Emilia-Romagna. Have any of you ever traveled to um, Bologna in that area of Emilia Romagna. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating story to tell where about one third, more than one third of that uh, economy is created by small cooperatives. And it is overall one of the you know, uh, most prosperous areas in, in Europe today. Um, so this, this, um, this food is my teacher. <laughs> food is the guide to the emergent living democracy. I'm also looking uh, very much at Africa, because Africa, when I was uh, in my 20s, Bangladesh was the basket case, right? Bangladesh was considered to be, you know, if they're hopeless, they can never feed themselves. Well, today, so many of the images are coming from Africa are images of abject poverty and failure and scarcity, scarcity, lack of just about everything, especially the soils you read and you can read. Yet, yet, what is emerging in several parts of the most, of the poorest parts of Africa is stirring and is, it can teach us so much. For example, in Niger, in, the, in Niger, um, the, the, it was colonized by the French. 
And over many, many uh, years, decades, uh, the, the farmers, the poor farmers, were very uh, worried that, uh, about the trees in, their, in any of the areas that they lived because the colonial government had told them that this, the trees belonged to the colonial government. And if you mess with them, you're in big trouble. And so, to stay out of trouble with the colonial government, they actually cut down trees so that they wouldn't be accused of, of messing with the firewood or what we did for firewood. Well, um, about 20 years ago, that perception began to change. And the legal uh, uh, arrangement, if you will, began to change. And farmers started to nurture and to allow to regenerate. This is not tree planting, of which I'll speak in a moment, but just allowing the, the indigenous trees and shrubs to emerge and nurturing them and keeping them going. And they have re-greened an area of 12 and a half million acres, 200 million more trees in this area, and they have effectively um, you know, reclaimed their agricultural land, that everyone was saying, no, 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 it's just hard pan, hard pan, you can't grow anything here anymore, give it up. And I was so touched recently by an article in Scientific American where a farmer was interviewed um, near a city, I've forgotten, but in any case he said, we turned back the desert and now our young people are coming back. But this was primarily farmer managed. It was primarily each one teach one, so it was very much not secrecy of patents and seeds that you have to buy, but it was sharing of knowledge among the people in this area. And one of the experts is a professor at a university in the Netherlands, who I've had this wonderful email relationship with, and he fed me a lot of interesting data about this. And so I wrote him, his name is Chris Reij, R-E-I-J. Remember that name, and you can look him up, R-E-I-J. And I said, Chris, but why haven't we known about this? And he said, no one thought to look. No one thought to look. Because it wasn't what they expected. Everybody hears Niger and they think famine. And so it just, I loved it, of course, because it fit my thesis that uh, we don't see what we don't expect to see. And also in Burkina Faso, um, um, closer to the um, Sahara Desert, uh, Burkina Faso, for example, a fabulous story. I'd love to, to recommend to you the film, The Man Who the Man Who Turned Back the Desert, I think, is the name of the film. But it's, it's a story of somebody who just said, no, I'm not leaving this, this area that looked just absolutely like the desert had already arrived. And people weren't able to eat anymore. And, and many, many families just left his community. And people got really angry at him because he wouldn't leave. And even some of his neighbors burned down his crops because they didn't want to believe that he was right. And he stayed there and started retrieving some of the ancient techniques, very simple ways of making small indentations in the land and then putting little bits of manure in and having termites come and come infected and, and they dig channels down so that the rain remains in the soil and the fertilization, uh, refertilization begins and they've reclaimed tens of thousands if not over a hundred, uh, several hundred thousand acres in that area. So um, I see that that again, um, this this is the, the themes I'm talking about here are the instead of just the blame game or you know waiting for somebody to solve it, people stepping up and saying, we can do this. We can learn from the uh, from the breakthroughs in science and draw upon what our ancestors taught, and we can do this. A lot of this is kind of their own. Uh, uh, farmer extension, you know, that we think of our agricultural extension, well, they kind of organize their own and they have fairs, they call them, where people come, many villages come together and learn these techniques and compare notes. That's in the Burkina Faso, a particular example. So, transparency, and there's so many other stories that I could tell you also from India. I could go back to India about women in Andhra Pradesh, a very poor dry land area there, where lowest caste the Dalit women coming together and creating their own food security system after, after suffering all terrible, terrible suicides in their communities and succeeding in um, a massive uh, reestablishing of the seed sharing process and returning the healthy mixture of plants. And this is also a DVD set that if anybody's interested, if I could share with you how to get this because the women have filmed their process. They taught, they learned how to take high quality video and their transformation of their villages is, is they have been, themselves have recorded. 
And so here we see these elements that I think creating the conditions that bring out the best in us. And that's why I, I, that the food theme in my life continues and the excitement after 40 years. You can imagine feeling like, you know, oh, you know, things I could never have imagined when I was just beginning happening. Like you, I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the community support of agriculture movement, the CSA movement that didn't even exist you know, until I was 20 years into Diet for Small Planet, after Diet for Small Planet. And what a perfect example of mutual accountability and transparency, because it's saying, we eaters, we're going to step up and invest, you know, our money at the beginning of the season and share in the risk. It, it has all those elements. And the transparency, though, in my family, we go out with my partner's grandson on Saturdays and get our, and get our food. And, you don't know. It's all the different things that start happening. The families show up and they start connecting with each other and it's like a picnic time. And then the effect on the next generation because my two-year-old uh, virtual grandson, he said uh, last, last uh, Halloween, he said, okay, Ben, what do you want to be for Halloween? He said, I want to be a farmer. <laughs> and at that point, the only farmer he'd met was a woman. So I thought that was even, even better. Um, and the doubling of farmers markets now and just in just this deck is just last decade to six thousand of them and the community farming as a tool for re-establishing community i just read a study this morning that detroit devastated detroit if they took even half of the land there's now vacant lots um city owned you know, vacant uh, abandoned property even half of it could meet with, with low productivity estimate, uh, they can meet 40% of the current, they provide 40% of the current vegetables consumed, and, and with high productivity, they can um, meet 40% of what is recommended vegetables. And this is happening. Uh, in Chicago, for example, I'm following the, 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 the evolution of growing home, which people coming out of prison with, as you know, in our society, we don't help integrate. And so they've created a growing, growing home where ex offenders come and learn how to do gardening and farming and get jobs then in the food industry. And they've now created a broad community coalition to, as they say, turn this instead of a food desert into a food destination in, in their community, a very uh, uh, lower income area in Chicago. And Indianapolis, for example, this could happen anywhere. They've decided that uh, they've made a, a um, they have four, they have, um, they have now about 80 pieces of land that in the financial collapse that the, they removed those, those bad structures. And now they're making them available free to any family that will commit to five years for gardening. And so they're hoping these small businesses can get started by not having to pay for any land to begin with and get their income going and provide healthy you know, farmers market or for restaurants and uh, in Indianapolis they have a community, uh, excuse me, a sustainability director for the city who came up with this idea and so far they've got almost 40 of them going. So what I'm talking about here is kind of the opposite of what our government in our, our government effort in Afghanistan called democracy in a box. Did you hear that term? Um, uh, that's the opposite of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about de democracy as a living culture, one in which we're very consciously creating not just dispersion of power as a one-way thing or a one-time thing, but the co-creation of power so that power is constantly being redistributed and, and created together. Um, and, uh, and obviously, in the same time, uh, transparency and that theme of mutual accountability. And that means, um, uh, let me just give you one very concrete example of what I'm talking about here from the fourth largest city in Brazil that uh, through its electoral process, which is more open in some ways than ours because it doesn't allow the kind of corporate um, funded uh, electioneering that we do, uh, they elected a city government in 1993 in Belo Horizonte, the fourth largest city in Brazil, that ran on the platform of the right to eat. That everyone, every citizen had the right to eat, not just anything, you know, not just bad food, but the right to have access to healthy food. And when they won, they didn't just, you know, 
lengthen the soup lines, keep power at the top and lengthen the soup lines, they brought in whole different sections of the community together to devise everything, small businesses, farmers, uh, universities, etc. And they devised dozens of innovations to keep healthy food available to everyone. And uh, so small plot of city on land, say near a bus stop in the inner city, they would make it available to a local organic farmer if that farmer would keep the food within the reach of the poorest people. And, you know, example after example like that. And when I went back a few years ago to see what the consequences of this had been, this engaged and, and creative outside the box, using the electoral process but going way beyond that, what had been the result? A 60% decline in infant death in 10 years. 60% decline in the city. And I calculated the cost. It was about one penny, one penny per resident per day in terms of what the city put into it. Um, so this gets all very personal, uh, and I just want to end on that note, a very personal note. Because if we really take this approach seriously, um, and we really then ask ourselves on a regular daily basis, how are we creating new power in our lives? Here as students, professors, people in the community, how are we being transparent and making ourselves mutually accountable? And so I think what's called on at least what I'm working on, I'll be so to say that, what I'm working on in myself is what I call bold humility. And by that I mean that we evolved in these tightly knit tribes where we knew that separating from the tribe was really the scary thing of all because the tribe was our survival. And yet I sense that metaphorically, you know, here we are, 21st century, and the tribe is heading over Victoria Falls. And so we've got to separate. We've got to. But it still is going to bring up fear. And that's where the boldness comes in. It's rethinking fear. Fear itself is an idea to a large extent. And we tend to absorb the idea that if we feel fear, it must be that we're in the wrong place, wrong time. But it might be when we get that pounding heart, sort of sweat, etc., that we're doing exactly where, what we need to be doing for ourselves, for everyone else. And so this boldness starts with that idea of seeing, seeing um, the discomfort, the, the fear of, of breaking out um, of the pack as something that is actually a source of energy. And my, my uh, cheesy little gimmick is that when my heart pounds wildly, which it usually does when I get scared, I've suddenly learned not to say, you wimp. But one day I decided, OK, I'm just going to say, enter applause. And it, it kind of works. It helps. Um, so that's the, the courage part of it. And, and part of the courage is understanding the power that we have. Remember when I was talking about the mirror neurons and how whatever you're doing, somebody, whoever's watching you is experiencing it? So if you are doing something edgy on this campus, taking some leadership, even if you're scared to death, somebody's watching you and realizing, oh, if she could do that, if he could do that, you know, there's part of me that's doing that. And, and um, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so the power that we have, the University of Virginia had students sitting, uh, standing at the foot of a hill, and they all had heavy backpacks on, and these two groups in this, in this experiment, um, one group had friends by their side, the other group did not. And they then asked them, how steep is that hill? And guess what? The students who had a friend by their side judged the hill to be significantly less steep. So, and the longer they knew that friend, the less steep the hill. So, you know, the more we choose our friends well, choose our friends who are gutsier than we and hang out with courage, we become courage because we absorb that courage, and stay with them because those are going to help us see the future as less daunting, building those strong, strong ties. And so the humility part of bold humility. Uh, well, the humility part is, gets a lot easier when you get old. But I'll give you, you can start at any age. And that is make a list of the things that really, really excite you and really like say, OK, I can you know, really give you energy. That if somebody had said to you five or 10 years ago, oh, that's going to happen, you would have said, nah, that can't happen. Make a list like that in your head, because that's what I do. And it really helps me. In other words, the story about Bella Horizonte, the story about in, in Brazil, no, 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 that couldn't happen. And it did. That's one on my list. 
the landless workers in Brazil. A land reform in Brazil, when I wrote about Brazil in the 1970s and how every attempt at land reform had been snuffed out with peasant blood, if somebody had told me in the 1970s or 80s that, oh yeah, there's going to be the most successful land reform in the hemisphere, it's going to be in Brazil, they're going to create you know, 20 million acres of new communities of growing organic food and ending hunger, no, that's not going to happen. Or if somebody had told me just a few years ago that the UNEP, United Nations Development Program, uh, excuse me, Environmental Program, uh, when they started their Plant for the Planet, have you ever heard of Plant for the Planet? Okay, I never heard of it either. Listen to this. I only heard about it because I was in Leipzig, Germany, high school, and there was a big poster about it. It was totally random. I came back and I started following it. In 2007, Plant for the Planet set the goal of planting one billion trees around the world. Regular citizens planting one billion trees a year. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, that's so optimistic. They're going to be so disappointed. You know how many trees now? 11 billion trees. So, and 900 of those, you'll never guess what country planted 900 million of them. Um, I think it's, nine, it's eight or 900 million of them. Ethiopia. And you know who was the president said was most responsible, accountable for that? Is the Boy Scouts in Ethiopia. So I'm saying that if you keep this kind of running list of the things that you doubted could ever happen, and then you have to acknowledge, oh, I was wrong, then what does that mean? It means we can be wrong again. I tell myself I could be wrong every time I poo-poo anything. I could be wrong. So what does that tell me? In a true ecological <coughs> worldview, where the only change, the only thing that's constant is change and connectedness, then it's not possible to know what's possible. It's not possible to know what's possible. And if that's true, we're free. We're free to gain that bold humility that we need and to just be very, very clear on why we're doing what we're doing with our lives, how it connects to the root causes, the false assumptions that keep us feeling powerless, and simply to go for it. So I would like to end my talk, uh, if I can find it. I just found this song. I'm not a singer, but I love the words to this song, if I can find it. <laughs> now I said that, I can't find it. Um, I pulled it out. Just bear with me one second. Ah, yes. Have you ever heard of, um, of uh, Susan Werner? May I suggest? Okay. This is, I love this song. So, now that I'm doing this, I'm screwing up. Okay, I may have to, that's just the end of the poem. So, Okay, well, I won't do that. I will end with a, with a poem. Instead of a song, uh, I will end in a poem by Denise Levitoff. It's called Beginners, but it fits everything I've been trying to say. It's so much shorter. <laughs> We've only begun to love the earth. We've only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can we tire of hope so much is in bud? How can desire fail? We've only begun to imagine justice and mercy. We've only begun to envision how it might be to live as sibling with beast and flower, no longer as oppressor. We've only begun to know the power that is ours if we would join our solitudes in a communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in bud. Thank you, thank you. <coughs>